Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for e-commerce espresso. If it's your first time joining us, welcome to e-commerce espresso, the webinar that's shorter than your coffee break. To keep these episodes as quick as and insightful as possible, uh, we don't hold any Q and A's. However, if you have got any questions uh, you'd like to put to Lord's Line or today's guests, then please do tweet us at Lord's Line HQ using the hashtag e-commerce espresso, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, so let's jump in. Today, I'm joined by Tim Alanius, uh, VP for Strategic Initiatives at American Eagle. Tim, would you like to tell the audience a bit about yourself and American Eagle? Sure, thanks. Uh, well, excited to be here today. I am uh, going on 12 years at AmericanEagle.com. I have been in the industry for two decades, though, so definitely have naturally led myself to strategy, a jack of all trades, not wanting to focus in on anything. I am happy to leave development server maintenance and all of that in the past. However, I really enjoy just working with companies and really looking at new initiatives that can come into play. And definitely in the past year, there's a lot to talk about for how fast people had to adopt into new initiatives. Cool. So you're dealing with all the fun stuff, all the strategy. All the strategy, all the fun stuff. Every single day is fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you, thank you. That was a that was a really great intro. Um, it's great to have you on board. So um, let's get stuck in with the first question. So I'm pretty excited to hear your thoughts on on this one. Um, from your perspective, what's the number one user experience trend that's affecting customer loyalty right now? Oh, that's a good one. And uh, honestly, trying to pick just one trend is 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 always the difficulty here. I'd always want to have more, but I got to keep it short and sweet. So. I'm going to kind of boil it down to two. One, it's just reinvention. Uh, overall, in response to the pandemic last year, uh, with just how people had to change the way they work, shop, access entertainment, everything. Everything was impacted, even school. Uh, during the Great Recession a decade ago, brands such as Uber, Airbnb, and Venmo emerged as disruptors. And in 2020, Airbnb, noticing the expansion of local bookings, they pivoted. And it's travel messaging for go near versus kind of that far destination. And they use new algorithms and just really looked at the opportunity to say, how do we shift and adapt to where we can meet people where they're either in lockdown, where they're stuck at home, where they're not wanting to go out and shop in physical locations. That reinvention of the way that businesses had to do their model, but also how other companies, I look at the movie theaters, had to reinvent their model and push things that they would want blockbuster in the theaters at the ticket box, right? They want to have that impact. Well, they had to do streaming events. They had to release in different cycles. They had to reinvent the way that they were connecting with their consumer. So that's one of the biggest user experience trends. How that affects loyalty is really the opportunity to use all of the data that we have, both advanced analytics and loyalty data to predict that recent behavioral shift and how it will affect your brand going forward. So that loyalty information is critical because last year, especially with logistical supply issues from the shipping timeframes that's kept going on and lagging outwards, loyalty started to dip for certain brands because people would stop waiting for their brand to have the, the product that they wanted and they would move into looking at where can I find the next best solution for that product instead of being as loyal. Then there was also the flip of that. And you had people who were extremely loyal, but it started happening at the local level, I felt. And I saw this a lot in my town where we had neighborhood guys getting together to order from a local brewery. And one guy would go and pick up and drop it off at everyone's houses. And it was a shift that usually we were going out together. Now we had to kind of bring it back in. So it's just an interesting shift how local businesses got a potential surge because of loyalty being now shifted from, oh, we can just go out to how do we support those businesses that are suffering through this? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely saw that as well, um, based in the UK. Um, it's good to see the community uh, crowd around, especially when it comes to the breweries and getting out uh, those kind of products. But I, I think messaging, as you kind of mentioned before, and that great example of Airbnb, it's key. And you know, that's been the case. You can read the kind of McKinsey and Gartner reports that says about uh, customers hating to be uh, misunderstood or miscommunicated to. And I think that, um, especially in a sort of year that we've just come out of, it's around kind of changing that messaging to the context. And, you know, we see it now that that context is ever changing. Um, and so it's really important to kind of nail down on that. 
a great example um, that I kind of uh, came across, especially last year, uh, we have a, a kind of uh, a shirt and tie and, and formal wear brand in the UK called Charles Tirrett. Mm -hmm. And just like sort of, um, you know, go near like Airbnb's campaign, they pivoted because their entire business was around going to the office, going out to formal occasions. And so they had this uh, pivot where they basically said, be formal at home and be the sort of smart working from home uh, sort of campaign. And it was great. And they even had their CEO um, in this kind of uh, content piece standing up after a Zoom meeting with his shirt on, but his boxes uh, or, or underwear on underneath. Um, so yeah, that was that's a um, great kind of way that you, you are reinventing and getting creative around it. Mm -hmm. I love what you said about kind of the entertainment piece as well. Um, because I think what we've definitely seen, especially when you can't have that kind of physical interaction with your customers anymore from a, from a brand perspective, uh, we start to see brands are coming more in tune with actually entertainment and actually entertaining their customers beyond just their product. Um, talking about breweries is a great example with Brewdog, who do uh, kind of craft ales and um, even sort of brands like Patagonia. It's all around entertaining and educating and being... Uh, very con content heavy towards their customers. Um, so yeah, completely agree. Some, some great points there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one last brand there just mentioned Yeti did a really great campaign where they actually provided some background video loops that you can just keep playing. So you'd have some different scenery and everything and it just fit the Yeti. I mean, Yeti and telling the story and, and getting out there into the way that they engage in their customers' lives is an incredible way to just look at a brand that started as coolers has now branched into other product lines, but they maintain a level of marketing communication that I think just steams the loyalty aspect of why they have such a following because they're willing to do different things and try different avenues of engaging with their customers, not just product marketing focused, but getting into lifestyle marketing focused. Just like your example uh, with Charles uh, DeWitt, if I Curious. say it correctly, um, uh, I still get their magazine occasionally. I've bought from them before here in the States, but uh, it is a way that you really look at the lifestyle that people have to live and adapting your marketing messaging to a, to fit that lifestyle. So it's exciting times. The, the, the analytics there is huge though, because there's so much that we can do with that data. And honestly, a lot of the work we did with customers last year in the digital marketing space centered around loyalty data because the easiest additional sale that you can make as an organization is to a prior customer. So why wouldn't you focus heavily on them? Because it takes three, four, five times more effort to acquire a new customer, build up that trust and loyalty when you already have customers that have done that, but are you reaching them at the right moment in the right you know, need and at the change in their life? Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously a little bit biased, but um... It's, it's really sort of refreshing to see that brands are starting to acknowledge this piece of retention. Um, and they're getting creative with it. They're getting creative with creating these sort of sensitive community uh, around their customer base and, and those who maybe don't see themselves as little customers, but maybe just have purchased previously. Um, so yeah, no, definitely, definitely sort of crucial there. Um, taking it back from the kind, of, um, the kind of marketing perspective and actually more around the sort of technology and, and the e-commerce perspective, there are obviously tons of different e-commerce platforms and e-commerce technologies out there for brands to help them boost sales and to enhance their marketing. But from your opinion, what is the first steps that a small business can make in terms of actually building the right tech stack? It's a great question. And one that we actually work with clients on a lot of times is we like to go in and understand your business needs first and your business goals. Because when we understand where you want to be in three years, then we can understand the right platform to recommend to you. We work with a good number of different e-commerce platforms because not one platform is right for every single customer that we work with. There's different platforms that meet different needs. So when we look at the opportunity there, it's really first and foremost about scalability. The first step in understanding how fast you expect to scale, once you understand that step and, and where you want to go as an organization, then we want to take that three-year plan and grow with the stack that we choose to implement together. And if you're going to outgrow a selected stack in a year, then you're going to have to reinvent the process all over again, spending time and energy on that 
instead of focus on continuing to grow your marketing effort, your sales and conversion rates, et cetera, et cetera. So just because Shopify is a very popular platform doesn't mean that it's the right platform for you if you are going to scale very quickly and you are going to need to go into a different avenue of selling. Marketplaces is a big thing that really stemmed out of last year. There were already marketplaces out there, but I think that they're just getting this resurgence because of just the way that different companies had to get together and how they're selling on different channels. And not every e-commerce platform plugs in nicely to play into different marketplaces. Are you going to have your own marketplace? Are you just connecting your feed to other marketplaces? So both the marketplace aspect, but overall the just ability for you to integrate to the rest of your marketing technology stack and any other technology stack that's part of your ecosystem is critical. And not every platform has a connection to the different tools that you may use. So look at what your tools are and see if that e-commerce platform integrates to them. Are there APIs available? How much custom work do you want to have to do versus it's more, and I use this in air quotes, plug and play, uh, because not everything is truly that. But that to me is the biggest, because if you can't have a platform that's going to scale with you for at least a three year period, then there's gonna be a repeat effort and you're gonna be constantly being stuck in the technology implementation phase versus getting into that marketing and selling phase that you really want the e-commerce engine to just be running and you have to feed it and update it every so often. Um, and then secondly, it's just, you know, as I mentioned, the capability to work with, there's so many intertwined additional technologies that are involved now. And I think a Scott Brinker's MarTech stack uh, landscape diagram, right? I think there's like 8,000 now on that thing. You have to have a magnifying glass or zoom in on a, you know, computer screen to see each individual logo now, but the number of just different technologies that you could use is incredible. So find the ones that you need, start small. We always talk about crawl, walk, run, because if you try and run right away, either you're going to buy a Cadillac when you don't need the Cadillac, you just need the Chevy Bolt. And, you know, I need to start using electric car terms here, but uh, overall, it's really just know what your needs are, know some growth predictions that you have, use that to make your decision on the best platform for you. I, I think as well, kind of that scalability piece, you know, especially when we've been speaking to our agencies and sort of hearing more from the kind of, from the market, we saw that from our perspective, a lot of merchants last year who were you know, rushing to digitally transform or get up and, and sort of get a full-fledged e-commerce platform. Um, you know, we're starting to hear in 2021 that a lot of them made the wrong decision. And so what they're doing is they're realizing that, you know, a year later, nine months later, that it was actually the wrong choice for that platform or, or that kind of tech stack. And they're having to reinvest it all again. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's what you guys are seeing as well, but we're definitely seeing that from a kind of fruits of that labor. Yeah, absolutely. We saw the same problem and it, in a way, it was a little bit of out of necessity that you'd rather get up and online selling fast in order to try and keep your business doors and light, you know, well, doors weren't open, but keep the lights on, so to say. And with that, it was at least they got on something if they weren't already on a platform. And that's where a lot of those businesses did have to make those decisions. And 2020, I kind of equate to the, hey, you just went on a sprint and you started off really well. 2021 is how you learn how to pace and you're now running the marathon, not the sprint. And so people are having to reevaluate and they're going back and saying, okay, yeah, we, we did stand up something, but we had to, now that we got through 2020, we now need to make some new decisions on the technology stack side. What are we going to do? And at the same time, we can't wait for perfect either. So iterative approach, agile releases are definitely key there. And the replatforming side does take time, but at least they can still maintain on what they have. And yes, it costs a little bit more, but it, they made that digital transformation. And so we knew digital transformation was coming for a lot of these businesses last year, forced the hand of actually getting it done a lot faster than anyone was used to. So uh, we're seeing the same thing, but at the end of the day, I still think in a way to call it a light at the end of the tunnel, at least they're in that space now where before, if they hadn't been forced into it, would they have moved to it even this year? Does it, I mean, everything shifted. So if they didn't adapt with it, that's where you see a lot of those smaller businesses just have to close up shop. 
And so now at least they have an opportunity to keep going. And, you know, I, I think there is the same to be said in other parts of the tech stack as well, looking at, you know, something like an ESP, for example. And like you said, if you look at that uh, MarTech landscape, it's every year you look at it, it's 5,000, then 7,000, then 8,000. And so it's such a, it's such a crowded marketplace. And I understand that it's hard for merchants or brands or retailers to understand what to go to what, go go for or, or where to go in terms of uh, the decision and the technology they're putting in place. And this is where merchants should lean on the expertise of their agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a really uh, a key part is that for a lot of merchants, you have that level of expertise, lean yeah. on that expertise to help you with that decision. Absolutely. And it's so tough, like just taking ESPs. I mean, so many of the platforms out there want to do more than what they originally were great at. And when you start to get that diluted marketplace of a technology that offers a lot of different capabilities, but it offers a lot, but not all of them great. How do you start to make that choice? Because it seems like you're reducing by going with one, but are you really getting the best advantage of what those different needs are from the different marketing technology pieces? And so instead of you know solving the puzzle by just throwing the whole box together and saying, hey, look, it's solved, all the pieces are together, actually fitting them together and making them work in harmony is where you need to find the right fit. Some of the all-in-one solutions or several solutions in one do work for your organization at a certain size, a certain need level, but the maturity and the growth of those is where you really have to evaluate what you want to do as an organization. And you should never pick a technology and fit your business into it. The technology should be able to fit your business. And that's a big thing that I just wanna make sure everyone listening understands is you should never walk into making compromises with a system that you're evaluating you should be able to find a system that handles what you want to accomplish and do. And if you can't find that, there's, I'm sure, probably one out there and you just need to involve an agency to help you find the right one. Yeah, discovery of what you want to achieve and then the research is key, I yeah, think. Yeah, absolutely. Is, uh, huge. Um, cool, so, I mean, one thing I do wanna bring up, um, Google has announced a new page um, experience update uh, for this summer. And I just wanted to know, you know, what can e-commerce merchants do to continue with that driving of loyalty and repeat customers, you know, after that update's been, been put in place? Yeah, that's a, a great question and, and one that you kind of have to wrap your head around, right? Because it's Google Core Web Vitals and how does that relate to loyalty? And so I want to kind of talk through each of those three points. Um, so loyalty and, and, and repeat purchases are a sign of a great experience. And really what Google's doing with this uh, update is focusing on three areas, LCP, largest contentful paint, FID, first input delay, and CLS, cumulative layout shift. And basically the three of these things all center around experience in a sense. And let me kind of talk through those. And, and again, your experience relates to loyalty because if you deliver a great experience, loyalty should be a natural uh, evolution of that relationship with a customer. So LCP, the largest contentful paint, that's all about site speed, basically. As I start to have the screen come up on my mobile device or on my desktop, that largest area that has to be visually built out, painted in that sense, needs to be fast. Helps the user with expectations overall, just they're seeing what they wanted to see. Did I hit the right page, the right product, whatever it may be. So really that's all about site speed. It needs to be fast. Uh, FID, first input delay, that overall is ensuring that users can interact as quickly as possible. And with that, it's just, there's a lot happening on a page, but they need to be able to take action before everything loads on the page. And so we wanna make sure that they have that opportunity to input onto your site with you know, just no delay at all. I wanna be able to click a button to go. I wanna be able to search right away. I'm gonna be able to swipe a, a banner image, whatever it might be don't let that be delayed because of other background uh, elements that are still loading. And then lastly, the CLS, the cumulative layout shift, this was a little bit more interesting, but to me, I'm gonna relate it back to, again, experience with the consistency of what an organization delivers between mobile device and desktop. And this is all about how much your layout shifts as it goes into that responsive mode on the smaller screen size from that desktop view. 
and there's a threshold that Google set and all the you know, Google tools will tell you how much shift is happening and, and you need to be uh, 0.2 and, and below of, in the amount of shift that happens. But when you really look at what you're showing a user on a small screen versus a large screen, ensuring that they still see the critical elements, the elements that confirm that they are on the right site, they're looking at the right product, Again, you're driving that experience throughout. So all three of these drive back to experience and that experience at the end of the day is what's going to help create and generate that loyalty overall. So we just wanna make sure that as that update comes out this summer, uh, they're gonna start rolling it out this fall, it's fully rolled out. That's where you wanna make sure your site is delivering on all of that because if you don't have it, you can potentially have uh, an index issue with Google and you might not be found as often. Uh, so that also creates a loyalty problem because the majority of people still just type into Google, even if they know the brand, they know, uh, you know, I could type it in the URL bar, everyone still Googles it first. So um, you just wanna make sure that that's there. Yeah, I think one thing that's definitely interesting to me is that mobile piece as well. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, again, we look at all the reports that come out annually, we see that, 2019, it was a kind of 50-50 split in terms of e-commerce and mobile. And then in 2020, it shot up. And I think it's now sitting around somewhere like 70. It again, mm -hmm. depends on the sources that you look at. And I just think that when it comes to actually delivering that experience, it's crucial. Um, you know, I, I was speaking to a, a merchant, this is a couple of years ago, and they did an analysis into their customer journey and how their customers actually interact with their, their sites. Mm -hmm. And they saw that you know, uh, a single customer might come onto their site six, six different times over the space of three to three months on multiple devices before they even convert to that purchase. And so it really just kind of shows the importance of having that aligned, consistent experience because, you know, each customer is going through not just the purchase, but their own sort of discovery and consideration phase. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, 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 it's crucial um, to have that consistency especially when they could, it could take a long time for a customer to go through that buying cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this with the distractions nowadays too, it's that much more important. They may start shopping. I do this all the time still. I'll start shopping, looking at something on my phone. I'll forget about it. And then I'm doing something at the desktop on my laptop and I'll be like, oh, I never finished ordering that. But then I almost finish on my desktop still. Now I know a lot of people, my wife's one of them, she, she does almost everything from her phone all day long. I don't know. I, I could never do that myself. I'm just not that person, but uh, she lives and breathes on that small screen. So she doesn't have that impact. So also use your data. And I know there's a lot of changes coming also with all of the cookie tracking and Google clock and everything else. So when you look at the analytics, you can see your mobile users, you can see the experiences that they have, where the conversions are happening. If your audience base, your primary one converts on mobile, ensure that mobile experience is great. That's your first foremost mission. However, don't forget about your secondary and tertiary audiences because once you've got your primary audience satisfied, you keep that experience for them, they're happy, they're loyal. Now focus on the next group of audiences that you have because those are the next ones to bring into that loyalty fold and make them a primary audience. And you know, just as a kind of final point, this is where it comes back to keep looking at the data, keep mm -hmm. up with the context. Cause if that starts to change for whatever kind of conditions or reasons or context as to why, you wanna make sure that that's optimized for the customers today and sort of moving forward. Absolutely. Cool. Tim, thank you so much for that. Unfortunately, that's uh, all we have time for. And um, that brings us to the end of this episode of e-commerce espresso. I hope everyone listening found it valuable uh, and have left with some great ideas and insights. As always, we will be sharing the on-demand recording, so don't worry if you feel like you may have missed something or, or want to go back and, and look at what we discussed. Um, one last big thank you for Tim for being today's guests. And remember, if you do have any questions for either Lawtoline or AmericanEagle.com, uh, just tweet us using the hashtag uh, ecommerce espresso. Hope to see you all again. Hi, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Ecommerce Espresso. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more of these short but insightful webinars, you can catch all of our previous episodes over on our YouTube channel. Just search for Loyalty Lion. Before you go, why not see if you can identify the gaps in your loyalty strategy that are costing you the most with our retention score sheet. You can see how your approach matches up with our downloadable tool over on loyaltylion.com forward slash retention score sheet. 
That's loyaltyline.com forward slash retention score sheet with no spaces. We'll see you soon for our next e-commerce espresso.